nerds and nerdettes and we little nerd things all. It's your buddy, Big John and G, the two gun fix it presents Legendary Gaming. Thank you so much for deciding to take this journey with me and discover a new game. So, to give you a little thematic overview, background, a story about what Dungeon Makers is about, let me just tell you the description straight from the publisher. So, this is building a diverse and danger-filled dungeon, scoring points based on creatures, puzzles, traps, and more. The dungeon maker who builds the best dungeon by scoring the most dungeon points wins the warlock's favor and the game. Who is this warlock? Who knows? Who cares? He's a warlock. He's powerful. He's asked you to build him a dungeon. But he's also asked someone else to build him a dungeon and he's only going to pay the best one. Who knows what he's going to do to the loser? May turn him into a toad. May send him into a different dimension. May do nothing and just send him home. We don't know. He's a warlock. <laughs> All right, so that's just a little bit of the thematic fun of this title. Now, uh, before I get into the actual gameplay, let me show you how it's set up. Sorry to disappoint you. Huh? You triggered my trap card. <laughs> Now the first thing to do in setup is that each of the two players, if you're playing this, the two player game, which I consider the base version of the game, the one player is sort of an option for this, but each player is going to be grabbing what they need, uh, starting with an action selection tile, a player aid tile, a scoring aid tile, a starting tile, a score cube, three block tiles, and five minion meeples. You'll then place the scoreboard between the players with the cubes on the starting marker. Now, each player is gonna take their starting tile and you're gonna place it in the middle of the table in front of you. Now, leave enough room because you're gonna be building out a five by five grid uh, as the game goes on. So make sure that you leave enough room between your five by five grid for the scoring tile and for the other player's 5x5 five five grid. I happen to use the action tile, the player aid tile, uh, the blocking tiles. I'll use them to, to set up a faux 5x5 five five to show me how much room I have, and then I put them back off to the side, just the way I do it. You're gonna then take the action tile that you have, and you're gonna set it so that it is the diamond side up, the black and white diamond side up. And you're gonna set that so that the upraised smaller black diamond is gonna be on the top of the card. Take your action tile and your scoring uh, aid tile, and along with the block tiles that you have, set them along to the side as well. Now, you're gonna take the 72 dungeon tiles and you're gonna divide them into three as even amount of groups as you can. They do actually, I believe, come out even for this aspect. And then you're gonna shuffle each of these three decks and you're gonna leave them face up, tile side up, so you can see uh, what's on the top of each of the three stacks. And you're gonna place them in the middle, uh, somewhere near uh, the scoreboard, uh, but again, with enough room on either side for each player to build out a five by five grid. And with that, setup is done. You are ready for your two-player game, and uh, all there is left to do now is to go over step-by-step. Step. Before I do that, I want to give a quick overview and then describe to you the different tiles. I feel that if you, if you know the tiles first, uh, you'll understand the strategy a little more, so you'll understand when I explain, turn-by-turn, turn, uh, the game sequence. Now, on a player's turn, that player is going to select and lay a tile or they're going to take a special action. Now, this is all dependent on the facing of your action tile, whether it's the blue diamonds facing up or whether it is showing the multiple actions on the flip side of it. 
Now, each player on their turn is either going to select and lay a tile from one of the three that are shown, that are facing up in the center of the gameplay area, or if their action tile is on the flip side, showing the multiple actions that it is possible for them to take, such as moving a meeple, placing a meeple, switching out a, a tile in your dungeon. There are multiple things that you can do, but you can only do one of them. Eventually, by this process, you're going to end up growing a sprawling dungeon that's going to be filled with encounters, traps, treasures, and more. Not only do the tiles provide dungeon points, but so do the icons that may appear on some of these tiles, as well as the meeples that you may populate your dungeon with. The game ends, generally speaking, when one player lays their 25th and last tile. Now, it can also end if both players end up having to pass a turn, the same turn. Player one passes, and then player two passes. If both players pass, then the game is over. Those are the two end techniques, the two end triggers that this game has. And at that point, you're going to go through the point system and see who accumulated the most dungeon points. Now, as I stated earlier, I want to jump right into the tile types and then the icons, and then we'll look at gameplay. Now, with the seven different tile types that you have, uh, the starting tile type, let's start with that, is considered a tunnel tile. Tunnels have brown colored edges along their pathways. These tiles always have a bonus scoring icon. Sending your minions through tunnels can score you additional dungeon points as well during the course of the game. So what that means is there are usually, uh, there are icons that you're going to find, and we're going over the icons next, and not only are they on tunnel tiles, but your meeples, your monsters that represented uh, the population of your dungeon, they can move through tunnel tiles. Now there's also chamber tiles. Chamber tiles have gray colored edges along the pathways and chamber walls. These tiles always have a bonus scoring icon. If one of your minions is on a chamber tile in your dungeon at the end of the game, then you get to score one dungeon point for that tile. So yeah, uh, a little bit of strategy. So you're already starting to notice a little bit of strategy. End of the game, if you have certain things in certain places, like this says, you're going to get some points. Maze tiles come up, and maze tiles have brown colored edges along their pathways as they count as tunnels when moving minions. When a maze tile is placed into your dungeon, you earn one point immediately. If you use the move a tile action with a maze tile, you also earn one additional point. If one of your minions is on a maze tile in your dungeon at the end of the game, then you get to score two dungeon points for that tile. See the strategy of placing things out and using minions in order to uh, max max your scoring potential. Now, water tiles have brown colored edges along their pathway and a blue colored edging in the water. When this is placed into your dungeon, you are going to immediately earn one dungeon point for each water tile in your dungeon, including the one you just placed. So yes, you see, it does accumulate. If you already have three water tiles down and you place a fourth one, then you're getting four points. That's nice! So collect those water pools up. <laughs> now the puzzle chamber tiles, they have red coloring edges along their pathway, and there were two dungeon points immediately when you place them, plus an additional dungeon point for each pathway that's connecting to another puzzle tile directly. And if you get to move a puzzle tile during the course of the game, then you're going to earn one additional dungeon point. So there are some tiles that it definitely literally pays off to use the, uh, the move action with. There's multiple ways to score points in this game. We have the Chasm Tiles. Now, these are the last tiles that you're going to be placing in your own dungeon. There's one other set of uh, tiles. We're going to get to them in a moment. But the Chasm Tiles, these tiles may be placed anywhere in your dungeon adjacent to another tile. Now, it doesn't have to connect with a pathway. Chasm Tiles are in one dungeon point, however, for each pathway leading to it at the end of the game. Now, minions cannot cross or move through or be placed into any tile that is a Chasm Tile. So this, this does, in a sense, help free you up, as you'll see, 
since you don't necessarily have to connect everything up. And that's a major point of playing the tiles, as you'll find out when we get into turn by turn of the game. Now the last, the, the last tile type we have here is something that you play on your opponent. And these are the block tiles. Block tiles are not actually dungeon stacks. You're not, you're not gonna find them in the dungeon stack. You have your three tiles and your opponent's gonna have their three. They can only be placed if a player uses the place a block action. Each player begins the game with three block tiles and if a block tile is removed by a minion, it is removed from the game permanently and not returned to that player who placed it originally. Players lose two dungeon points for each block tile in their dungeon at the end of the game. So you don't want these things there, and you have to move a minion there, as you'll see later. You have to move a minion onto that tile, adjacent to that tile, and then spend the minion, get rid of them out of the game, just to get rid of that, that collapsed area, that block tile, however you're imagining it being blocked for. So those are the different tiles. Now they do have icons. Let me talk about the icons and then we'll get right into how this game is played turn by turn. And I think this way, going into it with all of this first, you'll understand it a little bit better. Now we find four different icon types represented on the tiles in this game. The first type we'll discuss are the treasure chests. Can't have a dungeon without some treasure. Why else is anyone going in there? <laughs> Now, for each treasure chest in your dungeon at the end of the game, you're going to earn one point. However, if you have the most treasure chests at the end of the game, then you're also going to additionally earn another five points. Now, if players are tied for first, then each player is only going to get three points. There's no tie break. Now, there are also going to be other cards that have a symbol of stairs, like a flight of stairs on, uh, on the cards. Now this icon is going to earn you one point immediately when you place a tile with the stairs on it. Otherwise they have no value at the end of the game. There are tiles in this game that also have encounters on them uh, for anyone that delves into your dungeon. And there are three different encounter types. A minotaur, a cave crab, and a cyclobat. <laughs> that sounds cool to say. Cyclobat. Now, for each icon in your dungeon, at the end of the game, you're going to earn two points. However, for each pair of encounter types in your dungeon, you're going to earn an additional point. For example, if you have two minotaurs that you're in your dungeon at the end of the game, then you're going to earn four points plus one for that pair. That's pretty good. <laughs> and the final set of icons that you're going to find on the tiles, uh, again, you can't have a dungeon without this, and those are traps. Those are very Gygaxian indeed. And there are five types of traps. There's the Collapse Icon, the Spikes Icon, the Gargoyle Icon, the Pit Icon, and the Ball. Now these trap icons are worth points for each set that you have at the end of the game, depending on how many are in your dungeon. You may have multiple sets, but each tile icon may only be encountered for a single count of a set. So for one of them you'll get one dungeon point, for two of them you'll get three dungeon points, uh, for three of them you'll get seven dungeon points, for four of them you'll get 15 dungeon points, and if you have five you're gonna get 21 dungeon points. So the traps are definitely worth it for you to stack up on as you see. <laughs> now after explaining the cards and the icons, I feel ready to move on with the actual turn by turn how to play uh, for all of you. So come on and let's check this out. Now, at the start of the game, your very first turn, your action tile is going to be facing as it was dictated during setup, with the black-white diamond side uh, facing up, and that's going to be in a facing position with the upraised black diamond uh, on the top as you're looking at the tile. So when this is facing, you only have one choice, and this is telling you that you have to choose and lay a tile uh, from your from your choice, so the three stacks that are in the center of the two uh, would-be dungeon mazes here. Uh, so that's what you get to do. Now, during the course of the game, if you if you can't uh, take an action, if this is if this is the face that you have, and you can't draw a tile, then you have to pass. If both players on a turn pass, then that's end game. So when you place the tile there are certain rules that you're going to have to keep in mind. The first of which is that 
the tile, although you can change its facing, you can change its direction, you have to place it so that it connects to another tile. If there are multiple tiles that this is all going to be touching and joining, then it has to literally connect to each tile uh, that has uh, a way to connect to it. Now, although uh, I said it does have to connect, so if you have a, an open corridor, a tunnel, uh, on one it has to connect to another opening on, on a tile that it touches. If you are on the outermost edge, if you're at the fifth row uh, around your dungeon, it is perfectly fine for you to have an opening that leads out of that fifth row, that, that outside ring, if you will, of your dungeon. However, however, this will allow your opponent to be able to get in and enter your dungeon. And we're going to get to that right now. <laughs> so if you're, when you finish, when you finish your action, then you flip this action tile. So on the side we were just discussing, the blue side with the diamond, the black and white diamond on it, you flip that over and you're going to find multiple options, including lay a tile, the circular in the middle. You can always choose to lay a tile. Now, in order to use this side on your next turn, because now your turn is over, you get one action, you laid a tile, it's the very beginning of the game, you didn't have another choice. The second player gets to go, and being the beginning of the game, they also have no choice but to lay a tile. Now, as it gets back to you, now you have options, because your action tile has flipped. Now, in order to take an action, you, you have to move it left or right. You cannot take the action that is on the top of the tile. So in this case, you're going to flip over and you're going to have to either turn it left or right. And in this case, you notice that both sides show a meeple. Slightly different, but they each show a meeple. So if you turn it to the left, the meeple unadorned, if you will, is the place a meeple action. Now, if you have a meeple in your supply, and remember, you start with five of them, and then you're going to be able to place that minion into any tile on your dungeon that does not already have a minion on it. However, with the exception that you can't place or pass a minion through a chasm, as I mentioned earlier. Now, also, as I just finished mentioning, if your opponent has a pathway at the edge of their 5x5 five five grid, in the, in the edge of the ring there, uh, that, that opens up, and it doesn't have a minion on it, you can send one of your minions, one of your minions over there into their dungeon. And that's going to help wreak havoc with their scoring at the end of the game if they don't sacrifice one of their own minions to go deal with it. Now, alternately, you could have twisted the tile to the right and this shows a meeple with a fast forward sign and little dashes behind him and this signifies move a minion now if you have a minion in your dungeon and of course you need to have one there to take this action then you may use this action to move the minion through any number of tunnels or maze tiles until they reach another type of tile and doing this, you're going to gain, you're going to score one dungeon point for each tile that the minion touches while it's moving. That's a very clear way, I think, of talking about scoring. Every tile it touches while it's moving, you're going to get one point for it. Very straightforward and a rather simple way to score some points if you can get your maze built in such a way that you're going to have... Uh, several tunnels and or mazes all interconnected and touching with each other. Now, later during the course of the game, from flipping the tile back and forth, uh, it's going to cycle through the different actions that you have on this tile. The first one that you actually soar when it flips, uh, that you can't use on your second turn because it's on the top position, not left or right, then this is called swap tile. When you do get a chance to use this, it is called swap a tile. And this action allows you to remove any one tile from your dungeon with the exception of a block tile or your starter tile. Uh, those two types will always stay where they are. 
Now the removed tile must be immediately replaced from a tile on the top of the three dungeon stacks. Any one of them, any one of the tiles on any of the three dungeon stacks you can use to replace the swapped tile that you just threw out of the game. Now, of course, it has to meet the rules, right? It has to meet the rules of tile placement, but as long as you can fit it somewhere on your, on your, in your, in your grid, then it's good to go. Now, opposite that, as you see f uh, from the initial way that it looks, all the way on the bottom, when uh, that gets around because of flipping and twisting <laughs> this tile uh, in order to get an action to do, uh, this is going to give you two options. You can choose one of these two options. And that is either to place a block tile in your opponent's maze dungeon, or to move one of your existing tiles. Now, to block a tile, this is going to allow you to take one of the three block tiles that you have that you've set aside at the start of the game, and you can place it in any opponent's dungeon as long as it's placed adjacent to one of their tiles. And boom, you just drop that in, and the block must be connected to at least one pathway. See, and these blocks then cannot be moved or swapped normally by that opponent. Uh, it's going to remain in the dungeon until they're going to sacrifice one of their minions to go and get rid of it. And it's also going to give negative points at end game if you have any blocks in your dungeon. So you don't want them there for long at all. Now, once again, with the exception of block tiles or the starting tile, your other option that this gives you is to move a tile. And that's exactly what it is. You can move one of your tiles from somewhere in your dungeon to somewhere else in your dungeon. And when you move it, you can rotate the tile, of course, to, to make it fit where it's going. As long as it follows the rules and it can fit where you want it to go, then yeah, you're able to use this option to literally move a piece of your dungeon around move one of the tiles. Now, moving a tile does not score dungeon points like placing or swapping a tile does. Uh, so remember that. There is a difference uh, when it comes to scoring. You're not placing uh, and you're not swapping. You're moving, so you're not getting points for doing that. You do, though, in general, whenever you use the move a tile option, you are going to be gaining one point just for doing that. Unless, of course, it's a puzzle or maze tile, in which case you're going to get an additional point for a total of two, <laughs> which isn't too bad. And as I've already mentioned, just to bring everything back around, right in the center, you're going to see a circular option that looks just like the flip side, uh, because it is. Uh, and that allows you to place a tile. Now, just remember, after any action you take, you only get one action per turn, but any action you take, you flip that tile after you take the action. So this is going to give you a back and forth of things that you're able to do. And uh, it, it's also going to add in a bit of a strategy for what you need to do. You may need to, uh, to, to, to move a, a minion, but you might have to do two other actions before you can get that flipped and spun in such a way that, that on your following turn after that, it's going to be an actual option for you to do. I, I, on the side note, I actually just love that part of the strategy of this game. <laughs> and that really brings us to ending the game and scoring, part of learning how to play this. So, um, generally speaking, the game is going to end, as I mentioned earlier, when all 25 sections of your grid have been uh, filled in with a tile. But that might not happen. If both players end up having to pass consecutively on a place a tile turn, then that's going to trigger the end of the game as well. So those are the two ways that this game is going to end and enter into the scoring phase. And the scoring phase uh, is all really laid out for you on your tile cards, but let's let's take a look at them so you know exactly how to score, what to score, and whether you're the winner or the loser. <laughs> now you're going to gain dungeon points for any minions in your dungeon at the end of the game that are in a chamber or a maze. So let's not forget to score them. If you have any chasms in your grid, then you're going to get point. You're going to get a point for each pathway that leads into that chasm. Now, the blocks—I told you—the blocks are going to be negative points. 
Uh, you, you really wanted to try to get rid of them before scoring, sorry, because each block in your in your maze, in your dungeon, is going to be it's going to be two points deducted from your score. Now, you have minions. If you still have any minions that are out in your dungeon at the time of the scoring, then you're going to get three points. Three points for each of those uh, minions you have running around your area. But if your opponent snuck any in that you didn't get a chance to deal with before scoring started, then that's going to be a negative five points. Of your grand total score. Ouch. Now, each treasure icon that you uh, have on a tile in your dungeon is going to score you a point. And if you happen to be the player that has the most of said treasure chests, then you're getting an additional five points on top of that. <laughs> it's worth it to hoard treasure, isn't it? Now, the monsters, the encounters, the minotaurs, the cyclone bat, and the giant crab. Don't forget that you're going to be scoring uh, two points for each encounter icon that is in your dungeon and an additional one point for each matching pair that you also have there. We also have uh, scoring for trap icons, which I mentioned earlier, but to quickly recap, if you have one trap, that's going to get you one dungeon point. For two traps, that's going to score you three dungeon points. Three traps is going to score you seven dungeon points. Four will get you 15 dungeon points, and if you have five, that's going to be a whopping 21 dungeon points that you're going to be able to potentially score there. <laughs> now, uh, in the case of a tie, if, if, if all of this still ends off and there's a tie in points between the two players, then it comes down to the player with the most minions plus encounter icons uh, in their grid will be the winner. And if it's still a tie, then add on the traps. And if it's still a tie, then the game's a tie. What can I say? <laughs> and there you go. That is the setup. That is uh, the meaning of the tiles and the icons. And that is how to play the game uh, turn by turn. One action, next player. Well, actually, one action, flip your action tile, then the next player. <laughs> so, uh, but there's going to be some more videos. You'll get to see some playthroughs that we're going to do here on Two Gun Pixie uh, coming up. And uh, as soon as the one player option rules are ready, we're going to dive right into that and show you how to how to solo this game. So thank you for checking this out, and I hope you enjoy. I'm your buddy Big John and G for Two Gun Pixie presents <laughs> Legendary Gaming, and I am Ali.